Shalom family. Shalom. The soul food topic on tonight is entitled Customize My Jesus. <laughs> Customize My Jesus. Um, the reason I chose this topic is because, you know, many believe that, especially in Christianity, uh, evangelicals, if you will, um, they believe that it doesn't matter what color Jesus is, Jesus Christ is, it doesn't matter, you know, um, any of the debates that the quote unquote he, black Hebrew Israelites bring up concerning his nationality and historical uh, uh, accounts of who he is, his image and all that it doesn't matter. You know, it's just about Jesus and he saves everyone and God is love. And, you know, they just kind of make Jesus and the gospel what they want it to be, you know. You come to realize in this truth that Christianity is vastly different than the teachings of the Bible. Christianity stands alone as, as its own philosophy, separate from the Bible. It claims the Bible, but it does not adhere to the teachings of the Bible. Okay? Teaching that everyone can be saved. Teaching us that God loves everyone. Teaching us that the image of God and his son is ambiguous. No one knows. It's a mystery customize my Jesus, that the conditions of salvation, even among the children of Israel, is contingent or not even contingent, that it's, it's, uh, you know, it's personal, whatever you want it to be. You meet God the way that you want to meet him. Come, come as you are philosophy in this thing. Okay. Customize my Jesus. OK, like the build a bear workshop, you go and you get a template and you just kind of build it into whatever you want. You take pieces of this, you take pieces of that and you add it and you make it what you want. And now this religion has become something tailor made to your personality and your convictions. Right. Or lifestyle, lifestyle, whatever. You could be gay or whatever, pedophile, you could be whatever. And you can accept Jesus and, you know. Still find salvation, have eternal life, and have an expectation to enter into heaven. Okay? But we know that's a lot. All right? So we're going to bring out some precepts. But before we do that, I'm going to read this article from, like, it's called Snippets. It's like, I guess, a Christian um, article. And it reads, accepting Jesus as personal Savior. But it has a question mark. Accepting Jesus as personal Savior. It reads... Have you, quote, accepted Jesus as your personal savior? This catchphrase is so entrenched in evangelical Christianity that we would surely be in a major snit if it proved unbiblical. So remember, this is a Christian article writing about that catchphrase. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? These are things that we have heard if we were raised in the Christian church our entire lives. Whenever the pastor at the end of his sermon would have an altar call, he would you know, uh, leave it open for anybody who wanted to come and accept Jesus as their personal savior. From what my, from my understanding, Billy Graham was one of the first evangelical ministers to kind of coin that phrase, accepting Jesus as your own personal savior. Okay. And that you could say a simple prayer of repentance and accept Jesus in. Not hinging belief upon the Bible, but upon philosophy and doctrines of men. Well, we're going to read this article. Dare we inspect this evangelical sacred shibboleth as in as an Acts 17, 11 way? Well, don't panic yet. The phrase is at least half right. Jesus and Savior come directly from Scripture. The other two, accepting and personal, skipping the as and the optional your, will need a little more scrutiny. The uh, non clamature uh, cl nomenclature, huh? Nomenclature, thank you. Accepting Jesus as personal savior, of course, is not found in scripture, but that is okay as long as the phrase accurately reflects the transition or sorry, the transaction it purports to describe. Does it? Well, we uh, well, we will let A.W. Tozer loose on the accepting bit. Now, this is the, the, the author. 
Now, the particular attitude revealed here about accepting Christ is wrong because it makes Christ stand head and hat in hand somewhere outside the door waiting on our human judgment. We know about his divine person. We know that he is the Lamb of God who suffered and died in our place. We know all about his credentials, yet we let him stand outside on the steps like some poor, timid fellow who is hoping he can find a job. This is a Christian author writing concerning that philosophy as one can willfully of their own volition, of their own power, accept Jesus as their personal savior. He's challenging that concept according to the teachings of the Bible, at least from a Christian perspective. We look, we look him over, then read a few more devotional verses and ask, what do you think, Mabel? Do you think we ought to accept him? I really wonder if we should accept him. And so in this view, our Lord, our poor Lord Christ stands hat in hand, shifting from one foot to another, looking for a job, wondering whether he will be accepted. It will be at his word that the grave shall give up their dead and the dead shall come forth alive uh, forevermore. At his word, the fire shall burst loose the fire shall burst loose and burn up the earth and the heavens and the stars and planets shall be swept away like a garment. He is the one. He is the one, the mighty one. And yet there he stands. How grotesque can it be? The question ought not to be whether I will accept him. The question ought to be whether he will accept me. This is the Christian author writing about that. It goes on to say he has promised to receive us poor and sinful, though, uh, though we be. But the idea that we can make him stand while we render the verdict of whether he is worthy of our acceptance is a frightful uh, calumny, and we ought to get rid of it. John 15 and 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. OK, if you are having a cow over what has been pointed out so far, don't flame me. Flame A.W. Tozer. Now we turn to the personal part. Whether this is erroneous or not depends on what is meant. If what is meant by personal is if I were the only human being alive, then Jesus would have personally died for me. Then this is pure speculation based on a non-existent hypothetical. Just a suggestion here. Perhaps we should avoid speculative hypotheticals that are directly opposite of what we know to be true as a basis for doctrine or even phrases, especially when dealing with the great I am, as if God might have been or could have been different. Just who are we talking about here? Uh, a little bit more will be done. The point may seem subtle, but it, but it is one that God takes quite seriously. Are we to rewrite the whole the whole of human history? Shall we play fast and loose and make believe with God's revelation? The Bible has Jesus dying not in hypothetical speculation for a single individual in some dream world, but on a real cross and a real world for the corporate body of believers. Jesus is our real corporate savior, not my personal hypothetical one. The error here can be more serious still, still if it means that we think we can serve God without connection with his body. Hey, he is my personal savior, and it, and it is just between the two of us. While this is a popular notion, it is not biblical. Scripture calls us into fellowship with God and with one another. The plain fact is that we need each other desperately. Uh, read one more part here, and I'll be done. That Jesus is our corporate savior is an important point to apprehend in this day of division, jealousy, and rivalry among believers. Now, on the other hand, if what is meant by personal is that I must, be, I must myself be reconciled to God by Jesus, as opposed to anything my parents or priest or church or ritual might or could do, Salakia, then this is correct. There's only one intermediary between God and man, and we had better be at peace with him. If we are, it will not be just me and Jesus, for he is the Lord of hosts. Goes on with other stuff, but I'm going to leave it there for now. But the reason I brought that out is because that has been a major staple in the Christian church and into the way many 
uh, view the gospel, view Jesus Christ, view the Bible as a whole. OK, that we have the power to make the decision whether we choose him or not. Casting away predestination, according to scripture, casting away um, Israel as his chosen elect seed. This is where we get the idea of the spiritual Israel. This is where we get the idea that God loves everybody. This is where we get the idea that, you know, your prayer of repentance can wash, wash away the judgment that's supposed to be on those who have transgressed against the Most High. Okay? So I'm just going to bring a couple precepts out. Uh, I'm going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20, 21, and then chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 2 Peter what? 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And then chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It reads, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So that plainly states that the scripture is not up for debate. It's not up for private interpretation. You can't get 12 people to read the scripture and have 12 different interpretations or understandings of what the scripture says. There's only one understanding. It's not a private interpretation. So as the writer uh, A.W. Tozer was saying, Jesus stands on the outside of the door waiting for us to accept him. If he is found worthy for us to accept him, us looking him over, that is a Christian notion. That's not biblical at all. Okay. Goes on to say in verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So these words that are in the book, that are in the Bible, are the words of God. It is the spirit of God that moved upon man to write them. Okay, so they went from the mouth of God to the hand to paper. Chapter two, verse one through three. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying Yahweh that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. False prophets bring in damnable heresies. I meant to ask you, did you finish watching that IUIC debate with the Christian? The no, I was looking for it too today and couldn't because I lost it and I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. I would like to finish okay. that maybe at some point. But, you know, watching that, Bishop Nathaniel gets up there. Now, this this uh, this um, debate took place maybe four years ago, mm -hmm. debating against what the Southern Baptist mm -hmm. College, Christian, Christian, Christian College, Baptist. something like that. Christian church. Oh. And uh, Bishop Nathaniel gets up there. He starts in Isaiah and he goes to Deuteronomy. He brings out all scripture talking about that, you know, so-called blacks, Hispanics and Native Americans are the children of Israel going to the scripture to prove these things. And he has maybe five minutes or so to make his, you know, his oration. I think he had more than that. Well, you know, he, he had a little bit of time. He sits down. And the, the pastor gets up. Now, before Bishop Nathaniel even spoke, there was, I guess, a moderator or some sort of, you know, uh, a proctor who who got up, who got to went to the stand and said that the Christian minister who would be debating IUIC, that he's been in other debates in the past and he's never lost a debate mm -hmm. with haughtiness. <laughs> 
This minister said he's never lost a debate. So as soon as Bishop Nathaniel sits down and this Christian minister, older guy, probably late 60s, early 70s, older guy, right? We're happy to have you and we're not here to uh, act like we are enemies. We are not enemies. Uh, we are all, I believe, interested in doing what God wants us to do. And if we're not interested in that, then we're wasting our time. Now, I'm not going to try to answer everything that has already been said because I didn't understand everything that was being said. Now, I'm not going to try to answer everything that has already been said because I didn't understand everything that was being said. Did you guys hear that? The pastor stated that he had no idea what the bishop was talking about about who the children of Israel were. Did he never read about the children of Israel in the Bible? Let's continue. It's been said. I'm going to show you that in a debate, you must have a defined proposition, and then you must have a defined authority. And the authority to support the proposition is the Bible. Now you can't just run all over the Bible and grab this and that. Um, and gives his rebuttal. He starts off by saying he didn't understand anything that Bishop Nathaniel was talking about. Furthermore, he went on to say that we're going to come out of the Bible as though Bishop Nathaniel did not just use all scripture to uh, validate his claim. He started with Isaiah as a precursor, okay, to let the people know, look, I'm just not doing this of my own, you know, own power. The scriptures even say to bring these things forth. As Thess uh, Thessalonians would say, prove all things. And that's what he was doing. But as soon as this, this minister, this bishop, he gets up there, he says, you know, I, uh, 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 we're going to come out the Bible. He gets up there and I guess he think that he's preaching. He thinks he's doing something. All he's saying is Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's not about what you look like. It's not about any of that. You, you can't just go all over the Bible. Wait, what? Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. But this Christian minister said you're not supposed to go all over the Bible. What? And claiming he didn't come out the Bible when all he read was Bible scripture. Bishop Nathaniel, that is. And this guy gets up there thinking he's being eloquent and all that, not making any sense. So getting back to Peter. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Okay. Who pri uh, privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying Yahweh that bought them, bring and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So, if you were to watch this debate and see and hear this minister's tone, now... Uh, you know, we're not your enemies. Hopefully when this is all done, we, you know, we can have love towards one another, but we're going to come out the Bible, brothers and sisters. We're going to come out the Bible. And did from the, the first five or six minutes of him talking, I didn't hear him mention one Bible verse. Right. Bishop Nathaniel went immediately to the Bible mm -hmm. and had his reader recite the Bible. The, the, uh, the Christian minister uh, ref not refuse, but elected not to have his reader read. He wanted to read himself, but he didn't read no scripture. He was going off the top of the head. He was freestyling. And something else I noticed is that when Bishop Nathaniel was speaking and bringing all these things out, right? Discussing the plight of the so-called black man and woman and, and our existence here, here in America and how these things connect to the curses in the book of Deuteronomy and elsewhere throughout scripture, the, the place was silent. I didn't hear anybody make any noise. As soon as the, the other minister got up and started speaking, I'm here, amen, pastor, and all that type of stuff. He didn't say nothing. But listen to what was said here in Peter. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. 
pernicious, destructive ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So this minister will speak evil of IYC, Bishop Nathaniel, and the black Hebrew Israelites and cause the congregation who have followed after his pernicious, destructive, Salakia, wicked ways to view these men as heretics, to view these men as false teachers themselves, to view these men as ravening wolves. Didn't he say, actually, didn't he say not to listen to them? Didn't he say something like that? Wasn't he saying that? He was, uh... He didn't quite say that like that. He just, in the scripture, I think it was when he did finally read a scripture, it was like, continue on in the way that, you know, in... Yes, he did read a scripture. Timothy. Yes. So it was more so, which what me and you said, he's using that scripture yeah. to make sure his people don't start believing what Bishop Nathaniel was teaching, even though he came right out of the scripture. Yeah, you had no, you had no evidence, no biblical evidence to combat what he said. All you could do is try to. Furthermore, use witchcraft, deceitfully use the scripture to make your people believe, again, these are the bad guys. They're the villains. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. Mark of Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Mark Jacobson. You know what I'm saying? The witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to them. Listen to me because I got the Holy Spirit. Yes. Even though, like you already said, he said he didn't even know what they were saying, yeah. what they were talking about. So why not ask? For understanding because the scripture also says in all thy getting get, get understanding yes get understanding he, that he didn't try to ask for understanding he would rather keep walking in darkness and keep his people in darkness mm -hmm. instead of them all waking up yeah verse three and through covetousness shall they with feign words meaning pretend words meaning the words are not sincere Make merchandise of you, okay? Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Mm -hmm. Meaning there is a judgment for the wicked, for those who want to make this gospel what they want it to be. They make merchandise of you. If the gospel, if they try to retain the gospel in its pure form, it's not profitable for increase. It's not profitable for mammon. You can't make money off the gospel in its pure, unadulterated form because it only works one way. It's only for the children of Israel. But when you can manipulate, right, and make the gospel what you want it to be, when you can customize this thing, and make it what you wanted to be, this personal relationship that you can have and all this other type of stuff, this Christian evangelical philosophy, the philosophies and rudiments of men, then they can make merchandise off of you. And you see what's happening with the Christian church, whether white or black, the same things are happening. They make merchandise of you because you have willfully followed after their per pernicious ways. Okay? All right. From there, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. And it reads, because again, when we read the article, Breaking down that whole idea of accepting Jesus, right, as your personal savior. We're going to challenge that according to scripture. Romans chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So one of the major tenets of Christianity and Christian philosophy is that the law of Moses, as they understand it, is done away with in Jesus Christ. That through the coming of Jesus, who died for the sins of the entire world and all mankind, he's done away with the burden of keeping the law of Moses and has provided grace 
which is defined as liberty to do as thou wilt in order to appertain to some sort of mystic righteousness in Jesus. Without any laws, without any restriction, just kind of this vague idea of being kind and nice to each other, loving everybody, not judging, you are supposed to appertain to righteousness and holiness through that, you know, conduct, spiritual conduct, if, if as it were. But it says here in Romans that even in the end, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So for those who keep the commandments and break them willfully, or I'll put it like this, for those who have, have a mind to keep the commandments and break them, they shall be judged according to the law. For those who say the law is not needful in sin by nature of their rejection of the law, they Salaki, shall also be judged by that same philosophy. So the Christians will tell you the law is done away with. We have liberty in Jesus. But Apostle Paul is saying that even without the law that you choose to put away, you're going to be judged without it. You're still going to be judged. Okay. Now from there, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Did you read 13? I'm sorry. No, I didn't. 13 uh, of chapter 2. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So not the hearers of the law, not for those who simply read the Bible and say it sounds good, but then teach others to break commandments. But it is the doers of the law that shall be justified before the Most High. Now we'll move on to chapter 3, verse 19. Of Romans? Yes, of Romans. And it reads, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, is saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So all the things that the law says, it says to those who are under the law, meaning the children of Israel. And if the children of Israel are held to the highest standard of righteousness, which is the law of God, then how much more judgment shall fall upon those who are not under the law? Do you get what I'm saying? Right? So if if there, if the, if a, if an Israelite man is held to the standard of the law and he falls short, how much more a man who is outside of the law, who keeps not commandments, is guilty before the Most High? Because we just read in chapter two that without the law you'll be judged without the law, and keeping the law you'll be judged with the law. So whether you're in it or you're out of it, you're going to be judged regardless. So that every mouth may be stopped. So the Christians who willfully break commandments, these false teachers who preach this personal Jesus, this customizable gospel. OK, your mouths may be stopped. Your lawless deeds may be judged. OK. Go to. Micah chapter 4 verse 5 Micah chapter 4 verse 5 And it reads, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. So this is the prophet talking about the end times and where the children of Israel shall be delivered from captivity and placed back in their land. And the king of Messiah shall come and reign over all the earth. Okay. And saying at this time, for all people walk after will walk everyone in the name of his God. So all the other nations of the earth have their God. 
They have their deity. They have who they worship. And they freely do it. Okay? But there is a higher standard that falls upon those who are under the law, according to Romans chapter 3. And we will walk in the name of our uh, name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. So all the other people of the earth, they, they do base things. They keep not the commandments. They follow after not the most high. But we know the way. We know the way of righteousness. Okay? I'm going to bring some more scripture out real quick. Isaiah chapter 40. Y'all think. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 17 through 22. Yeah, I don't want no distractions. Stop that. Um, because, again, the topic being customized by Jesus. We have this view based off of Christian theology that the gospel is for everyone. They don't read the Bible. They don't have an understanding of the Bible. They just, they read what they want to read and receive what they want to receive. And they've taken what they want and have made it to be what they want it to be. He read in Peter that the scripture is not of private interpretation. You can't take this book and make it what you want it to be. You can't take two thirds of it and say, this is what I want. The other one third, the condemning judgment part of the Bible, you can't cast away or whitewash or water down and say, mm, I, 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 we'll just, Jesus came, his blood came and washed that away. No. It's not of a private interpretation, but men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the words of God. You shall be judged. Okay. What verses? Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 17 through 22. And it reads, all nations before him are as nothing and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Now, this is a hard pill to swallow for the evangelical Christians because that does not fit into the Jesus loves everybody doctrine. Not when the prophet is saying that the most high God does not view these nations as very much of anything. They are vanity, less than nothing. Micah says that all the nations of the earth have their God. Apostle Paul says that the idols and gods of the nations are nothing. So you think about it this way, you are what you worship. We know that the most high God has all power. So we as his people are special. We're above all nations. We're as great as our God. The other nations worship idols, demons, which are nothing. So if they follow after nothing, then they're nothing. And the scripture confirms it and saying that the nations are less than nothing. If their idols are nothing, then the people that follow after the idols are less than nothing. Okay. Verse 18, to whom then will we liken God or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning that ye not, have ye not understood from the foundation of the earth? 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof as the, as are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So he's saying that the children of Israel, we worship the Most High Yahweh, but all the other nations, they have no understanding. They go and find a tree, chop it down, make a graven image out of it, and worship it. Something that they made. Vanity. And this is the same thing with Christianity. It is a religion. It is a belief system. It is a way of life that was made at, by the hands of men. 
They have formed this image, white Jesus. They have given him ideals and convictions and beliefs loosely based off the Bible. And men have followed after the pernicious ways of this false image and the false teachers that push this false doctrine. It's the same thing. Whether it be Balaam, whether it be Dagon, whether it be Molech, whether it be white Jesus. It's all the same. Whether it be Allah, Muhammad, whatever. It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Okay. See, still in Isaiah, I'm going to go to chapter 44 and read verses 8 through 10 and then 17 and 18. Okay. Can you read that for me? Isaiah chapter 44, verses 8 through 10 and 17 and 18. Okay. okay. 8 through 10. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yeah, there is no God. I know not any. Salakia. So the prophet is saying, is there any other God besides the Most High? So not just the fact is there God, because Christians believe there's only one God. But what he's truly saying is, is there, who makes the decision? Who makes the rules? Who, who does everything? I do. Is there anyone else who can change what I say? Is there anyone who's jurist, who, is anyone whose authority supersedes mine? Not only am I the only God that, and creator and all of that, but I am the, the highest authority there is. And my word is law. There is no one who can come and change it up and manipulate it and make it what they want it to be. There is none besides me, but me. That's it. Keep going. Verse nine. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know. That they may be ashamed. So, like you, so the doctrines that men establish through the vanity of their wicked heart to make a graven image and to make this form of worship, they become ashamed. They become ashamed. They know not. They have no understanding in them. They have erected these things and they bow themselves down and worship and have commended their lives to a piece of stone, a piece of wood, a vain ideal. These things will not profit Christianity and your accepting Jesus as your personal savior doctrine shall not profit. The scripture is saying. We got to look at this thing through a, a clear spiritual lens. These modern religions, these modern forms of idolatry shall not profit. Keep going. Verse 10. Who hath formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Profitable for nothing. Keep going. Verse 17. And the residue thereof he maketh a God, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, deliver me for thou art my God. So this is the same philosophy for all of the evangelical Christians that go to church every Sunday morning. And, you know, they get down and they pray and worship white Jesus, believing that he will save them. Or even all of our brothers and sisters who go into the black church on every Sunday morning, every Friday evening. Right having prayer services and all of that, having revival services and fasting and shut-ins and all that, praying to their God. They believe that God that they serve and they worship is the God of the Bible, but the, the God of the Bible lets us know that his word is who he is. And if you follow not his words and you follow him, not 
So if you're going outside of his word and outside of his law, then you're not following him. You're following some other God. And you have already placed this image, this wooden cross that you bow down and worship. Or, you know, the, the, the stone monuments and statues outside of the Catholic parishes. It doesn't matter. You hold your rosary beads and you believe that God will hear your prayer. You say, deliver me out of my distress. The most high is not hearing you. You praying to some false God. You don't obey the voice of the most high and his voice is right here in the word. You follow after man-made religion that is loosely based off the Bible. But it does not adhere to the strict commandments of the Bible at all. Did you read 18? No. Go ahead. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their eyes that they cannot understand. Their hearts. Their hearts that they cannot uh, understand. Yes, I'm sorry. Um... Okay, from there, can you grab Jeremiah 16, 19, and 20? Jeremiah 16. And 20. And 19 and 20. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, Yahweh. My strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. Shalakia. Again, the topic is customize my Jesus. They have their belief. They have their idol. They have their religion. And they're perfectly content with it. You hear the brothers out there contending with evangelical Christians, Mormons, those of the Church of Latter-day Saints, discussing the scripture, Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're bringing these things out, reading scripture out of the Bible. And they'll try, you know, to try to grab other scriptures to try to combat what is being said. But precept upon precept, line upon line, these brothers are bringing out the truth and they realize that their religion falls short. That their religion is just what it is. It's a religion. It's not according to the Bible. It's according to the philosophies of men. And so on that great day, when the true Messiah comes, who's not in the image of the idol, the global idol that the whole world has received, the image of the beast, if you will. The Gentiles, the heathen nations that are counted as vanity and less than nothing shall come and say, man, this was a load of crap. We've inherited lies. This was a load of garbage. This whole Christianity and all that was crap. We was worshiping white Jesus and believed that he was the way. Keep going. Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? They are no gods. Shall a man customize and make his own gods? You saw how we read in Isaiah, a man to get a piece of wood that will not rot and, you know, get a cunning workman and say, hey, brother, I'll give you $20. Can you make me an image? What you wanted to look like? Uh, you know, make, have a with a strong chin and, a, you know, a wide nose and keep giving big muscles and all that. Yeah, I got you, bro. $20, $20, but I'll be back in a couple hours. All right, cool. And you sh shape it up. Here you go, $20. Oh, man, that look nice. I like that. And you're going to paint it real nice and I'm going to put a gold chain on him. And I'm going to put it in my living room. And every morning I'm going to come and give them some food. You want some bacon and eggs? Let me give you some worship. I, I remember going into one of the apartments in the place where I work, the uh, apartment complex. And one of the tenants, the Napoleon, probably a Moabite or whatever. But remember going into one of the rooms and in there they had a shrine 
to one of their Hindu gods, one of their false idols. Then they had the shrine there in the corner of the room. And I literally saw, you know, they had the picture, whether it be Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, I don't know the name of these gods, but they had the picture of, of you know, their idol on the, on the, on the, on the sheet, on the, on the wall. And they had food and had other little trinkets and different things. And they had money up on, I think it was like a dresser and they had a little shrine in the corner there. But it had money up there. And now I'm not a thief or anything, so I wasn't going to steal it. But I turned, it grabbed my attention because it wasn't just like a dollar, a couple dollars. I think it was a hundred dollar bill. A hundred dollar bill on this shrine to be given unto the gods of the Hindus of, of Elam or of Moab or whoever it is. A hundred dollar bill cannot see, cannot hear, can't move. can't move, can't do nothing with that money. Got food, got all types of stuff up there. That hundred dollar will profit me more than it'll ever do your God. Why don't you just give me that hundred dollars? He don't need that. He or she or whatever that thing is, because they always got the depictions of the male and female, but they look exactly the same. OK, but he, they had a hundred dollar bill on this shrine to the gods of the Hindus. I'm like, what? That is crazy. Foolishness. They have no understanding. Now, of course, they are fully convinced this is the God. This is the God of tradition for them. This is their God. Remember what Micah says, all the nations will worship their God, but we shall worship the most high Yahweh, the only true and living God. But all the nations got their own little gods and they'll bow down and worship their little idols and all that stuff. This is ridiculous. But this is what they do. Even furthermore, they'll have their Buddha. It's like they have all types of gods in there. They'll have little Buddhist uh, trinkets and different things throughout the house. Have Hindu trinkets and different, you know, Relics and whatnot, pictures and stuff of Shiva and all that. And then also have a big old picture of white Jesus. I've seen it. These Nepalians be having pictures of Jesus juxtaposed to a picture of Shiva and Brahma and Vishnu. And then have a picture or a little Buddha idol over on the, on the coffee table. Just today, I'm walking past one of the Napoleon uh, apartments. I'm able to, they have the window wide open so I can see right into their living room. Got the big screen TV and got it on, I guess, the Napoleon station. They all got their own little YouTube station they love to watch. It's like their culture is all the same from each apartment. All the Napoleons, they do the same kind of things. They eat the same kind of foods. They watch the same kind of television. They listen to the same kind of music. They wear the same kind of clothes. Okay, but they had the television on and it was on some sort of channel and it had some image, I guess it, it looked kind of like one of them gods, maybe the elephant with the multiple, you know, trunks and stuff like that, whatever Hindu god, god or goddess or whatever. And music is playing. It has this image on the TV with colors behind it. And it's just it's just that and music playing. It's like, is this, you know what I'm saying? Is this your worship time? Is this worship sh session for you? You just leave the TV on to, to just usher in the spirit of worship to your false God. Start your day off right. You know what I'm saying? This is the vanity of the nations. But not only will they worship these ancient deities. If these oriental nations of, you know, all over the world. But then they also have joined hand in hand with Esau, the so-called white man and his image. And his God, the great white hope, Jesus Christ, who came to save everybody. It's like you might not, you must not have a whole lot of faith in Brahma and all that if you believe in them, but then also in Jesus. So that you believe that white man's God is greater than your God. Think about it. Esau got the whole planet convinced they can worship their God, but in the back of their mind, they know this white man's God is greater. Why? Because just like I said, you are like you you are as great as your God is. And if this white man is greater than all because he reigns over the entire earth, then his God must be greater than all. 
If his God gave him the power to have the earth as the dew of heaven with the, with the sword of violence, then his God must be great. The God of Esau must be great. The God of forces must be very great. And so you can worship your little God, but you know in the back of your mind, the white man's God got some power because this white man can do whatever he wants in, in the earth. And his God gives him his God gives him the power to do so. But the day shall come when all the nation of the earth, the Gentiles shall come and say, we have indeed inherited lies. This is a load of crap. And now we will bow down to the true and living God and his Mashiach, Yahweh Shai. Okay. Was that 20 of Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're going to go to John chapter three, verse 18 and 19. And it reads, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So this is Yahweh Shai speaking himself and concerning his own people, right? Those who believe not are condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. When it says name is not just his name, but his title, his reputation, his image. Okay. When you mention Michael Jackson's name. Okay. It conjures a particular image. Now, for Michael in particular, you might have two images in mind. You might think of the younger Michael when he was still dark skinned. They had his afro or had his jerry curl and wore the glove. And then you might think of the older Michael. Once he started bleaching himself, thin, little petite nose, looking scary. <laughs> so you might have two. But you know this. Uh, we'll say Michael Jordan. Okay. Michael Jordan didn't bleach himself. So when you talk about Michael Jordan and you mention that name, it conjures an image. A 6'6 black man with a bald head and a red jersey with number 23 who can jump really high. That's what you conjure thoughts of. When you say the name Michael Jordan. So in the same way Yahweh Shai is saying... He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name or the reputation or the title or the image of the only begotten son of God. You are condemned already to all the nations of the earth who have inherited lies and have rejected the true image to take upon their own image, this idol. They are condemned already. They receive him not. And they're going to weep. The tribes of the earth show more in the scripture say. Especially when this wrathful, angry black man comes back with vengeance. You mean to tell me he's a black man? I didn't know that. Y'all going to be butt hurt when that happens. Um, 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So light came into the world, but those in darkness refused to walk in the light. They were wicked. All right, two more scriptures will be done. Titus chapter one, verse 16. Titus chapter one, verse 16. And it reads, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So when you talk about the Christians where their belief, their Christianity is loosely based off the Bible, but not truly adherent to the teachings of the Bible, it fits the scripture to a T. They profess that they know God, right? So they'll go to church and hoop and holler and sing and dance and foam at the mouth and bow down before their idol and cry out and say, God, deliver us and hear our prayer. They claim that they know God, but in works, they deny him. Yahweh Shai said, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. All throughout the scripture, it says to keep the commandments of God and live. So they say they love God. They hold their hands up and they sing songs and, you know, run laps around the church and do all that. And say, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. But in works, they deny him. Yahweh Shai said, you shall know them by the fruits they bear. They say in one thing, but their lifestyle is showing a totally different character. Denying him, being abominable. Being abominable. How does one become abominable? If their works deny them becoming abominable, then what kind of works? They're not righteous. If they're counted as abominable, meaning something the Most High hates, then their works cannot be righteous. Then the works that they perform that make them abominable must be abominable as well. So what are you saying? That these people don't keep the commandments of God but they break the commandments by doing that which is abominable in his sight to make them abominable. Like what? The eating of pork. He said, if you eat of the swine, it is an abomination. They do these works which make them abominable. There are a lot of different things. There are six things. Doth God hate? Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. If you do these seven things, guess what you are? Abominable. You are greatly despised in the sight of the Most High. But these are the things they don't teach you in church. Why? Because they have their own type of doctrine that they made up. Customize my Jesus. Accept him as my Lord and Savior. My personal Savior. I make the conditions, the terming conditions of this relationship. I'm not going to be adherent to the teachings of the Bible, but the teachings of the great Catholic Church. The Christian philosophy. Okay? And disobedient unto every good work reprobate, meaning their minds are blinded. Back to uh, the debate that we were watching. Bishop Nathaniel got up there and was preaching and he didn't even get into a good. He only, he only brought out a few passages, but he was hitting hard. He sits down, his brother gets up and says whatever he says, which he's not saying nothing. And the people, uh-huh, go ahead, Bishop, go ahead. Reprobate, disobedient. It becomes stiff. Stiff-necked in their disobedient way. They're reprobate. You can't even say anything to convince them otherwise. They have inherited lies. Okay, last scripture. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Can you read that for me? 1 John what? Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Last scripture. So, based off of what we read here in Titus... It says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Now, let's see how you are to appertain to God in righteousness, according to the scripture, not according to Christianity, not according to philosophy, not according to the rudiments of men, but according to the Bible. Because the second Peter said that scripture is not given a private interpretation. So you can't read the Bible and get your own understanding. There's only one understanding. One true understanding. Go on. Verse three. And hereby we do know that we know him. Uh-huh. If we keep his commandments. Say it again. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. So this is how you know if you know the most high and you serve the most high and you are pleasing to the most high. If you keep. His commandments. But there is another people, like according to Titus, who profess they know God. John is saying, this is how you know if you know God. But there are people who profess to know God. Yahweh Shai said it in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, that on that day many shall say, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name, perform miracles in your name, cast out demons in your name. And he'll be like, Get lost, kick rocks. I never knew you. What? No, 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 no. I, I, I pay my tithes and offering faithfully every Sunday. 
You didn't keep my commandments. You kept the Jesus rules. You kept Christian ideals. You didn't keep my commandments. You were abominable. You were disobedient. And ever into every good work, reprobate. Get lost, beat it. Keep reading. Verse four. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. What did it say in Isaiah? Was it? No, I'm sorry. Jeremiah 16. That the Gentiles shall come and say, indeed, we have inherited lies. Why? Because this unprofitable idol that we have bowed down to was a false, uh, uh, a false philosophy and a false religion that taught us not to keep commandments and to reject the true image of the Most High. So we can't customize this thing. You can't customize your own Jesus and make him whatever color you want him to be and make him, you know, to, to do whatever you want him to do. It's about adhering to the Bible, the word of God. This thing is for the children of Israel. It's not for all the nations of the earth. Just let us know in Isaiah that the nations are as nothing, less than none, nothing. Vanity. Vanity. 